Merci, Monsieur le Ministre, euh, d'avoir euh, tracé ces perspectives et, et apporté votre concours aux rencontres du développement durable avec cette journée Construire une Europe durable. On va tout de suite commencer notre panel qui euh, se déroulera en anglais puisque nous avons euh, la chance, l'honneur d'accueillir le commissaire européen aux crises, Yannick Lenarchik, que je vais euh, un, accueillir parmi nous. Mais d'abord, permettez-moi de présenter euh, nos invités, le commissaire européen aux crises que je, que je viens de, de présenter, mais également, juste à ma gauche, M. Jean-Marie Guéheno, qui, euh, après une carrière de diplomate euh, très poussée, euh, a occupé, entre autres fonctions, euh, celle de secrétaire général adjoint des Nations Unies pour le département des opérations de maintien de la paix. Euh, essentiel s'il en est, et euh, a également exercé à la tête de l'International Crisis Group, désormais également euh, professeur à Columbia University et au auteur d'un ouvrage absolument essentiel dont, euh, Monsieur Guéno, vous nous direz euh, quelques mots, je suis sûr, au cours de cet échange, je n'en dis pas plus tout de suite. Juste à ma droite, Mathias Vichra, secrétaire général euh, du groupe Danone. Euh, qui, euh, entre autres, track record euh, extrêmement intéressant, a, a eu à gérer euh, comme directeur de cabinet euh, de la maire de Paris euh, ce moment euh, du, du C40 absolument incroyable, euh, de la coalition des villes pour, euh, pour le développement durable, ou plutôt plus précisément pour le climat, et qui, euh, pour Danone, s'est occupé des grandes coalitions internationales auxquelles euh, ce groupe euh, a pris part, notamment le Business for Inclusive Growth, euh, pour réduire les inégalités lancé au moment du G7 de Biarritz. Juste à ma droite, un peu plus loin, Stéphane Allaire, président et fondateur de Reforest Action, une des entreprises euh, les plus en pointe sur la protection, la restauration des forêts, un des sujets majeurs sur lesquels l'Union européenne se bat euh, ces, ces temps-ci pour lutter contre la déforestation importée. Euh, Stéphane et moi avons eu le plaisir de, de cofonder le Global Forest Summit qui s'est tenu en mars dernier sous le patronage du président de la République. Et Stéphane, qui, qui plaide pour des, un impact de terrain sur ces sujets de développement durable, va également nous apporter sa vision d'entrepreneur. J'ajoute que nous avons à distance Denis Simoneau, vice-président de L'Oréal. Bonsoir Denis. Également euh, président du think tank Europa Nova. Euh, deux casquettes, euh, s'il en est, avec lesquelles nous allons euh, pouvoir euh, jongler. Je n'ai qu'un seul regret, messieurs, c'est qu'il n'y ait pas euh, de femmes euh, pour moi qui suis féministe, et je sais que Denis partage ce combat euh, très fort avec moi, je suis sûr que les autres panélistes également, pas de femmes à bord de ce panel. Les, les RDD sont plus que paritaires dans l'ensemble, mais sur ce coup, on a échoué. J'en suis absolument navré. I'll switch now into English so that the panel can run. And I'm happy to, to take a look at the first question I wanted to ask. Um, as Europe has put together one of the strongest agenda on Earth, To, to, to deliver on sustainability. Let's have a look at it. And Commissioner Lenarczyk, I'm happy to ask you the first question of that panel. Could you pr present, it, present us from the Green Deal to Next Generation EU plan uh, up now to Fit for 55 uh, uh, package, how uh, the EU has shaped its ambition for sustainability so, so that we have uh, a picture of what is at stake now? Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Good evening to everyone. Uh, The Green Deal has been the number one priority of this Commission since its day one. Actually, it was adopted on the day 11 of the mandate of this Commission. And it uh, charts the way to the action of the Commission throughout its mandate. Uh, the Green Deal contains a lot of ambition, a lot of goals, a lot of uh, a lot of goals that we want to achieve, but two of them are uh, the most important and I want to single them out. The number one is to reduce the emissions in Europe, in the European Union, by 55% by 2030. And the second, the ultimate goal is for Europe to become a climate neutral continent by 2050. And Europe, the European Union, was the first major power to define this goal in such an ambitious manner. Others have since followed, uh, but the European Union was the first. Uh, the second element is uh, the next generation, or to use its technical name, it's a recovery and resilience facility or plan. It was triggered immediately after the beginning of the pandemic. The pandemic, of yeah. course, had uh, important negative impact on our economy, on our society. And that's why the Commission conceived this uh, recovery and resilience uh, plan in the forum of Next Generation EU as a plan to address this negative impact, 
on European economy and society. However, uh, it still has not been done in isolation from the Green Deal. On the contrary, it's, it fits very much on the, in the Green Deal agenda of the Commission. So while we were very busy, everyone, <clears throat> with dealing with the pandemic and its fallout, we kept the Green Deal as number one priority for this Commission. And that's why the next generation has also been elaborated in the manner that fits perfectly with the Green Deal ambition. Just to illustrate how that has been done, 37% of all the funds available under the next generation EU, and these funds, as you know, are not negligible. They go up to 750 billion euro. 37% of the funds that go to the member states of the Union, which is the largest part of this overall sum, need to go to green investments. 37%. So this is also how we want to achieve the goals and the ambitions defined by the Green Deal. And finally, <clears throat> the third element is the so-called Fit for 55. 55 meaning here uh, the 55% reduction of the emissions by 2030, which is almost tomorrow. It's only nine years from now. Uh, it's an ambitious goal. It is a challenging uh, goal. Uh, it won't be easy to achieve, but it is possible. And the Commission, with its package of Fit for 55, has defined several measures on how to get there. So, in short, while the Green Deal is about what we, as the Union, want to achieve, the next generation and the Fit for 55 is how we want to achieve that. Thank you so much, Mr. Commissioner. I'm, I'm happy to take those inputs as the, the, the key driver of our questions here. And, and I'd like to turn to Denis uh, Simono. I said, Vice President of L'Oréal, one of uh, the sponsors of, uh, of that event, uh, Rencontre du Développement Durable, and also Chairman of the Think Tank Europa Nova. You've been yourself a career diplomat in Brussels, working in EU affairs, and, and you know a lot how Brussels can be slow or bold uh, at the same time. So, a fit for 55, is it also fit for 2030? I'm, cu I'm curious because it sounds like a bold plan, but is it bold enough to be, to be fast? And, and, and also in comparison to the US Green New Deal plan that President Biden has put together, or the Chinese ambition net, net zero by 2060, is it, is it bold enough as, as European can, can want to lead the way forward? Thank you and good afternoon to uh, all of you. Um, yes, I, I think that uh, as, um, as the minister said and as the commissioner confirmed, I mean, uh, the European Union is uh, far in advance compared to all other countries uh, in the world. Uh, even though I think that the new president of the USA, uh, Joe Biden, would like to appear as the leader on uh, the struggle against uh, climate change, I think that since the European Union has developed a lot of uh, policy and we will work on that uh, later on, I'm, I'm sure. I think that uh, clearly uh, this uh, master plan is very impressive. But I, I must say that uh, to, and to confirm what the commissioner said, I think that uh, we will succeed uh, in uh, implementing this master plan first if we agree on the recovery plans. I would say plans because, as you know, each member state as to implement its uh, recovery plan. And it's very important that all member states uh, uh, will, will comply with that. The first uh, aspect is the uh, Green Deal, as the Commissioner presented. Uh, but on the Green Deal, which is a, a, a set of uh, different texts and uh, a, a series of uh, pieces of legislation, uh, we have to obtain an agreement between the Council and the European Parliament. That's the second condition uh, to be successful. The third one, I would say, is to, uh, to set a price on uh, carbon, uh, because you know that the, the price of the carbon uh, uh, is not very high today, even though it's better than a few years ago. But we should continue to set a price on carbon. And for that, there is a proposal, which is this uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism uh, that the French presidency of the European Council will uh, uh, put as a priority during the presidency coming the 1st of January. 
let me remind you that um, the previous presidency in 2008 um, was working on that project already and uh, it was quite difficult to obtain an agreement on that and i know that today it's not uh, consensual and uh, we need a lot of work from the french presidency to make that acceptable by all member states and by the open parliament the last point i wanted to uh, stress on is um, as you said thomas i, I work for a, a big uh, multinational l'oréal and uh, for a few years now l'oréal has um, uh, participated to the science-based target mechanism. Important to stress on that because, you know, uh, we will succeed if all actors are uh, concerned and are uh, committed uh, in uh, this project of the European Union. And the big companies has a role, have a role to play. And the science-based target mechanism is a very interesting one because, you know, you look at the uh, what we call scope one, scope two and scope three, uh, scope one is the uh, activity of the organization of the company. Uh, scope two is the uh, energy supply that uh, uh, is provided for this activity. And scope three is the rest, of, meaning uh, all stakeholders uh, dealing with the company. And for a company like L'Oréal, you know, if you take scope one and scope two, where we can have a direct action, it is only 2.5% of the greenhouse uh, gas emissions of the organization. So that means that without the support of our suppliers, customers, all stakeholders, we will not succeed in the reduction of the uh, greenhouse uh, gas emission. And so to me, it's a very important issue because you know that means that all organization, all actors, have to embark all their partners, all their stakeholders, if we want to be successful. Thank you. That's very interesting, Dennis. Thank you so much for putting to, together the, this, this key issue of uh, coalizing actors uh, from the top to the bottom and, 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 and all along uh, value chains. The, the UN Secretary General often says uh, it's, it's, uh, it's now the decade of action, not anymore the decade of declaration, and that to achieve this global net zero ambition, there is a need for a global net zero coalition. Uh, I'm turning then to Matthias, who's been working a lot on coalitions uh, at the global stage uh, at, for Danon Company. And I'm, I'm, I'm curious to know how you've been working on this, because when we, when we refer to sustainability issues, we've seen companies dropping dates, figures, and, and, and impressive plans, but we don't see the results, and, and, and there is a lot of expectation about this. So um, those expectations also mean a lot of fear. In my generation, like young people, 75% of them believe that we won't have a sustainable future. We won't have any future at all, which is like devastating, actually. So. How do we address this fear? Is this because we do lack of ambition? If we hear the commissioner, we don't lack of ambition. Is this because we lack of a plan? It sounds like we don't need a plan anymore. We have it. Uh, is it because we need to bring together other actors? How have you been working on this at that end? Thank you, Thomas, uh, and uh, congratulations for the organization of this, uh, of this meeting. I think it's very valuable, especially in this uh, very period of time. Uh, first, I would quote uh, the Pope, uh, John Paul II, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid because uh, obviously the future is challenging, but there are some ways, there are maybe also some solutions. The first one has to do with collective action. Definitely, if there are some silos, governmental silos, company silos, NGO silos, it won't work. We need to have collective actions. And I think that coalitions and the need with L'Oréal, is very involved in that coalition because uh, we have built uh, with Danone and other companies, with NGOs, with international organizations, with the support of governments, two main coalitions in 2019. The first one is Before IG, Business for Inclusive Growth, to tackle inequalities with 40 companies, with figures, but also with money, with an incubator, and with a fund to tackle inequalities. Yeah. The second I'm, one... I'm just like dropping here uh, a, a very important precision is that uh, when we speak about sustainability here, we don't mean like climate issues. We also mean uh, the whole SDG agenda and number one priority of the SDG agenda is tackling 
poverty and inequality. So this business for inclusive growth was definitely part of SSC. Yeah, GDC. and this is not a, a think tank, this is an action tank, definitely. The second one is OP2B, One Planet Business for Biodiversity, to tackle the loss of biodiversity in our plates, to restore soil health and to restore a kind of regenerative agriculture, to move from intensive to regenerative agriculture. And this is very powerful if we are gathering governments, NGOs, international organizations and companies, we could have an impact. The second aspect has to do with a clear framework. Companies need clar clarity from governments, from international organizations. And I think that it has been said by Mr. Commissioner, in the wake of the Green Deal, the fact that we have now a biodiversity strategy by 2030, that we have a farm to fork strategy is a clear step to have and to promote sustainability inside companies. And this is a clear step. And now we need obviously to connect the dots with the common agricultural policy, because it's very good to have a biodiversity strategy, but it needs to be inside the common uh, agricultural policy. And I would finish by saying that uh, at Danone, uh, we wanted also to promote what we called a call to action for a food policy at the European level, and not only an agricultural policy. What it means, it means first restore soil health. It means, for instance, uh, to have a Nutri-Score as a mandatory label. It means also to, um, to have a, a common policy on water resources. And this is the right step in the wake of the biodiversity strategy to improve the capacity of companies to have the right impact. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm happy you, you, you take this um, avenue of coalitions and, and frameworks because that's actually what we... Uh, yesterday we had a full panel about doing a new ideology to achieve this paradigm shift, etc. And now we have a plan, we have a framework and we just need to implement it. So that's very clear. Uh, but still, there is a question, is that enough? And I'm turning to Stéphane Haller. I, I remind uh, you are the president and founder of Refresh Action. Um, I'm asking not because the, the plan doesn't sound good. I mean, it has been proven. It sounds so good that the, 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 29, the 27 member states of the EU has adopted it. But is it enough to, to get to net zero? Uh, don't we get to, to, to go beyond net zero, to regenerate? You've been speaking about regenerative agriculture. And, and last year, this, uh, this, uh, this spring, when we organized uh, with uh, Stefan the Global Forest Summit uh, together, we thought maybe net zero was, was already very ambitious, but maybe nature needs more. And that's why I'm turning to you, uh, uh, Stefan. How can we get to a more circular bioeconomy um, to, to regenerate the planet while we only mean now reduction and compensation of our footprint? Yeah, you're right, um, Thomas. The um, net zero is ambitious, um, but it's, a, to my mind, a defensive approach. And what we uh, need and what is a, a more positive look at, uh, at the world is to have a regenerative approach. Um, I fancy doing positive things, not negative things. So imagine um, an approach where I can restore the environment while creating wellness, business, growth uh, is a lot more positive thing. And you mentioned the Circular Bioeconomy Alliance, which is one coalition that a number of organizations work uh, on, and uh, which is initiated by the Prince of uh, Wales, Prince Charles. This one is very close to my heart for a number of reasons. But the first one is, it starts by having a new look at the way we approach business. It's circular, not linear and it's based on the living and not on fossil fuels. And if we choose to have this look at our economy, it changes a lot of things. My role is to restore forests and create forests. And forests cover 40% of uh, the European Union. They are home of 80% uh, of land biodiversity. They store huge carbon emissions by themselves. They produce, you know, food 
they filter water, they retain soil, they are good looking, so we like uh, walking in forest and, and we feel better in forest. But they are also the starting point of this circular bioeconomy because they produce renewable energy with wood and they deliver a number of benefits that we uh, 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 that our businesses rely on biodiversity Dunham relies on biodiversity big time l'oréal relies on biodiversity big time as well like a lot of companies so approaching our economy through the new eyes of circular bioeconomy reminds us that we rely on nature and we need to rely more and more on nature and as opposed to fossil fuels uh, if we want to regenerate our economy. That's, that's essential and indeed we, when we hosted this uh, Global Forest Summit to also advocate for a more regenerative approach, we had the chance to host uh, the colleague uh, Commissioner Sinkevicius, uh, a colleague to Commissioner Lerchik, and he said indeed that he was working himself on this more bio, uh, bioeconomic circular uh, approach. Uh, that's why I'm turning back to you, Mr. Commissioner Lenarczyk. Um, it sounds like EU is leading the way for sustainability and has set the tone at the global stage. Yet we, we see consequences keep terrible. And, and as you're in charge of crisis management, I would like to look a bit at the consequences if we miss the point here. Um, how do you assess the threats uh, the disruptions that the climate crisis will entail if Europeans fail to lead the way. Is the EU ready also, uh, is the EU also ready to take up the challenge uh, when, well, we've witnessed uh, a lot of skepticism during the COVID-19 crisis uh, to, to face the crisis. Here we have a bigger crisis. Are we ready for this? Uh, we've been questioned so much at the EU level on, on our readiness. I'm, uh, as a crisis manager, I'm, I'm very curious to know how you anticipate those new risks? The risks are real and the climate crisis is already there. Uh, and uh, for those who don't believe it, I would just recall this last summer. This summer started with devastating floods in Belgium and uh, Germany, floods that took 200 lives, floods that uh, were of such dimensions that nobody recalls them in living memory. And then the, it continued with, with forest fires that engulfed the entire Mediterranean part of Europe. It started in Cyprus, continued through Turkey, Greece, North Macedonia, Albania, then Italy, then France, and uh, then Algeria. And in these cases that I mentioned, Europe was called to help. And we were able to respond. We were able to respond through the contribution of many EU member states to all the requests for help. So as far as the response to this um, climate crisis is concerned during the last summer, European Union and its member states proved that they are ready, they are prepared. Because this was unprecedented year, at least at, as far as floods and forest fires are concerned, but the response uh, we were able to, 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 to put in place. However, crisis management is not only about response. It's, uh, it's not only about preparedness. It's also about prevention. And here, much more has to be done. We still have a lot to do to prevent the worse than what we are witnessing already. And that's the logic, uh, the entire logic of the Fit for 55, of the reducing emissions, of forest strategy, of biodiversity strategy. These are all preventive measures. We want to prevent the worst that may come if we don't do anything. So yes, uh, <clears throat> we uh, were prepared and we were able to respond to the crisis uh, that, in, that uh, <clears throat> occurred this summer. Uh, but much more needs to be done, and especially on prevention, to prevent even worse crises that uh, will come in the future if we don't uh, if we don't act in preventive manner. I think the worst is at stake here, and 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 that's that's very difficult because um, uh, preventing the worst is not what makes a company move forward. 
preventing the worst is not here. It's getting to a brighter future. And, and that means a lot for investors, for those who, want, uh, to, to, for those who lead uh, um, um, companies and are entrepreneurs. And that's why I'm turning back to Stefan again. Uh, your company, Refresh Action, is not a, as huge as Danone, as, as Laurel. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bold and quite amazing team of 50, 60 people uh, active in 35 countries around, uh, across the world to protect and restore forests. Yet, you, you're not such a big company, but you have to invest money. You, had, you have to project uh, yourself in the future. When you look at those gloomy perspectives, how do you keep faith? Oh, it's very easy. Um, I'm part of the solution. And uh, therefore, it's... Uh, you know, if, if I just give it up, um, well, giving up is not an option. And I find these times very exciting. Yes, it's, uh, it's a bit scary, but it's exciting. I mean, we've got this huge opportunity to be able to bring a response to, to the crisis. We can provide answers. We can act. It's time for action. It's the UN decade for um, ecosystem restoration. I mean, this is, this is a big deal, and we're part of it. And forests are the cornerstone, to my, my view at least, uh, of this restoration. We need to act big time. And you're right, I run a small company, 60 people, come on. But I was yesterday with the Prince of Wales. We partner with the European Commission we have strong partnerships with uh, large corporate accounts uh, around the world. It's not the size that makes the uh, importance. It's the action and the vision. And I believe we've got both of that. Yeah, I'm sure. And I, I, I would like to recall one funny story that I love. is That first we met it was when uh, we wanted to have the Rencontre du Développement Durable not only able to activate citizens in getting involved in sustainability, but also bringing them uh, to action to sustainability. And I recall to everyone listening to us that for every person getting subscribed to the uh, Rencontre du Développement Durable, which are free, you take part to reforestation thanks to uh, reforest action. So thank you so much. Ambassador Gaino, I'm turning to you, which sounds like uh, getting to New York and this uh, UN General Assembly sounds very far away from forests. Though Central Park is very beautiful in those days, um, but it's, it's all about trust, trust in, in an entrepreneur, in himself, but also trust between nations. And as we face increasingly uh, um, bold tensions between nations, trust is decreasing very, very, very much. Um, we hear almost every day the UN Secretary General saying it's about action. We need to get to the emergency point. It's red code. That's, that's the words we hear every day from the White House to the UN Secretary General. And, and I'm very curious, is it only about words or is it, is it meaning something here? Because uh, we've lost faith somehow in the international ability around this crisis to address such challenges. And, and though we know it's a global challenge, so we need such a system, uh, and if we don't have it, there will be geopolitical consequences. As you've been in charge uh, of the UN uh, Peacekeeping Operations Department, I'm very curious on the way you anticipate those consequences for geopolitics. Well, peacekeeping is an operational activity of the UN. Here we are talking about a different role of the UN, setting goals, uh, being a flag bearer, so to speak. And that is important, you know. Uh, words do matter, actually, because today you have a variety of views on uh, climate, you have a variety of views on what to do, and it's essential that countries come together around a few clear goals. And that's what the UN can do. Uh, it's, a, it's a painful process, it requires a lot of patience, but it's important to have a few references. And I think the figures we all know now, the 1.5 degree uh, uh, limit, uh, uh, the, the cut in, uh, in, in emissions, uh, <coughs> the, the need to have uh, 70 billions, for instance, to help adaptation. These are figures that were painfully negotiated, discussed, but then they become a reference. 
And the UN is a kind of compass. You know, when you navigate a difficult sea, uh, if you don't have a compass, uh, you, you're not going anywhere. And that's fundamentally the role of the UN. But there's another role that is less visible, but this visible role is the most important in my view. The other role is to, to help countries come together in a more discreet way. For instance, at the moment, you have a number of countries that still rely on coal uh, for power production. And they, they cannot move away from coal from one day to the next. Uh, it's a transition that they have to manage. If they work together, they can do a better job than, they, if, than if each of them has its, its plan. Then there is obviously the big question of China and the United States. Uh, we know that uh, if China uh, doesn't make a major shift, the, the hope of really turning the page, it won't, it won't happen. Um, Xi Jinping announced at the UN General Assembly uh, a few days ago that, for instance, China will not export uh, uh, coal-powered plants anymore. We will have to, to watch whether that really happens. But this is the kind of thing that has been prepared quietly, uh, and that then comes to the fore, and the whole world is watching. And that's the role of the UN, to put countries on the spot, so to speak, so that they feel that the world is watching and they do something about it. And if we don't have that, then you have a kind of chaos and things will go backward. Yeah, indeed. And putting on a spot is key here. Uh, that's also the objective of, of this event, to, to highlight the major issues we need to address. Uh, we've been speaking a lot about the ambitions, the plans, the schemes to, to get there. Um, but there are many consequences we need to anticipate already because we've witnessed it. Uh, Mr. Commissioner has already mentioned some of the consequences we have seen this uh, summer. Um, uh, there are many other consequences that will entail new uh, conflicts, tensions like migrations. And I'd like to also uh, address this, um, this issue. It's also the same for adaptation. Uh, therefore, I'd like to turn to Denis Simono again. Um, adaptation is key because we are getting further into the climate crisis, which is real now. How can we push a bolder agenda at the EU level for adaptation as we only speak about carbon reduction? Uh, carbon emissions reduction so far. How do we put together a new plan for adaptation? Yes, you're, you're right, uh, Thomas. And uh, as the, the commissioner said, uh, the, the impact of uh, climate change is obvious uh, on, uh, on, in many countries and on many issues. Um, under control of the commissioner, a strategy was set up by the European Commission uh, earlier this year in, in February to, to uh, uh, make this adaptation possible. Um, and we can see that e even after events like the financial and economic crisis in 2008, or after the COVID-19 crisis, um, the uh, greenhouse gas emissions are continuing to uh, grow on a very uh, dangerous track. So we need to uh, do something. Uh, the, the, the fact is that we have uh, uh, no way uh, and we have to adapt. Um, and uh, making this adaptation, um, that's the role uh, of the Commission to make some proposals. But as I said previously, uh, each member state has to implement a national adaptation strategy. Uh, the public and the private sectors uh, should work together. Uh, and the role of the non-state actors, we call the non-state actors, meaning the NGOs, the companies, the local communities, the civil society in general, uh, is essential. Uh, the, the fact is that we need also uh, green sciences. Uh, we need to have uh, very robust data, uh, very uh, uh, um, uh, precise uh, risks assessment. Let me take an example on the health issue. You know, we know that there is a connection between uh, uh, what we face during the COVID-19 and climate change, but we should base that on very uh, strict and uh, scientific uh, data. Uh, the EU uh, is well positioned to, to, to deal with adaptation. As uh, Matthias Vichra said, you know, the common agricultural policy, for instance, is taking care of that. But uh, all policies of the European Union uh, are facing some uh, 
adaptation necessities. Uh, take the regional policy, take the energy union, take the water policy, take the fiscal, even the economic and fiscal policy uh, has to uh, take into account this uh, adaptation necessity. A last word on uh, uh, the international uh, action, because uh, adaptation is all part of the uh, uh, external policy of the European Union and its member states. Um, and uh, there are uh, some, some specific areas where the European Union is already playing a role and should continue to play a role in adaptation. Uh, in Africa, in the small uh, islands, uh, in the least developed countries, but also in the neighborhood countries, uh, the uh, Mediterranean or the Western Balkans. And we should base this adaptation policy on the uh, uh, UN SDGs, you know. To conclude, I would say that adaptation is crucial. Uh, it's a crucial element of the global response to uh, climate change. Uh, the EU uh, has a role to play, definitely, and a very positive role to play. Uh, but it will be through uh, a strong of all partners, all actors, public and private, state or non-state, uh, local, global or national. Thank you. And I'm, I'm very grateful you've highlighted how intertwined our, our own health and nature health are, are connected. That's also the approach of the One Health Initiative that the WHO has launched. And we had the honor to host Assistant Director General of WHO on, on Monday to speak about this. And, um, uh, but as I'm turning to, that, to, to, to Mathias, uh, as health has been at heart of the, the business model of, uh, of a food company like yours, um, and that means you're very cautious on the way adaptation strategies can swift your business model. And, and, and I'm, I'm very curious on, the, on, on knowing how you anticipate as a company which, are, which is like a global firm with roots everywhere, how do you anticipate to such um, adaptation issues? How do you adjust to such hazards for your workers, for your revenues? for your stakeholders, for your shareholders? Um, how, how, does it, how do you uh, encapsulate everything in a, in, a, in a global strategy for such a group? Um, Stefan told us that uh, deforestation is not an option. I think that uh, disruption is not an option. It's not an option for companies because of the fact that there is a huge, a strong trend to shift all the capitalism model. And I think that in a way, uh, I have four different ideas very quickly uh, to show that it's possible to move uh, when it comes to impact, when it comes to disrupt the traditional model. The first step has to do with B Corp. B Corp is not only a US certification, only 40% of companies are American. This is, also, this is also a European strategy that needs to be um, developed, supported, uh, to have B Corp as the global label to measure impact, to measure the governance, the social and the environmental strategy of companies. And it's consumer facing. And I think that being B Corp is really, really powerful. And for instance, Danone is the first multinational and we will be 100% certified by 2025. The second aspect has to do with following the trends of consumption. Uh, you were speaking about uh, consumers. For instance, they are more and more flexitarian, which means that we need to adapt the products to this very important trend. And people, and not only in Europe, not only in France, they are becoming more and more flexitarian, then we need to adapt. The third aspect has to do with the entreprise à mission, benefit corporation. Uh, Danone is the first listed uh, entreprise à mission. There are more than 2,000 uh, entreprise à mission in France, which is good, but we need to have more companies. And this is a very important step because in your status, you have the mission of the company to be impactful when it comes to social and environmental topics. 
Second one, you have a mission committee. It changes the governance. There is not only the board or the COMEX. You have a mission committee with independent experts that can check if you follow, if you fulfill the goals of your mission. And I think that the, for the French presidency of the European Union, promoting the entreprise à mission model could be, I think, a right measure. Because I know that there are some debates in Spain, there are some debates in Italy, and that could be the right role model uh, to change a company's model. Last um, aspect I think that is very important has to do with finance. We need to connect the dots between sustainability and finance. It's possible. Just one example. With banks, uh, we had two years ago a loan, two billion syndicated loan, uh, with the loan rate that decreases due to the ESG goals that we achieve. That means that there is the right connection between your impact and finance. And I think that in the future, this is what we need to do, to connect the dots between sustainability and finance. And definitely we need organization, international organization for that. We need governments, we need incentives, and this is feasible and this is really what we need to do. And as a motto, I could say that in the future, and even for finance, the motto could be be sustainable or be irrelevant. Thank you so much, Matthias. I'm, I'm grateful you, you've touched those points. Recalling that this proposition for entreprise à mission at the EU level is one of the key ideas you could share on the platform for the conference on the future of Europe as it's, oh, this event was also organized to foster reflection in that framework and, and, and prepare uh, next uh, legislation packages. And second is that finance, uh, uh, sustainable finance is the next day of the Rencontre du Développement Durable on next Monday. So it's, it's a very good transition. I'd like to turn it back to you, Ambassador Geno, um, because um, Mathias said earlier on uh, that we needed frameworks. And obviously, the global framework we need is at the UN level. Um, and here, I'm curious, if we look at the consequences that uh, climate disruptions can have for people, for states which can fail, for migrations that we already witnessed, for highlands that can be overloaded, uh, overflooded, how the UN is equipped to face such human-shorian consequences uh, that will blow us way beyond the, the type of crisis we've seen so far. You've been working on Darfur, on Côte d'Ivoire. Those were already kind of crises uh, related to climate disruptions, but those very little crises. At, at this stage, is the UN ready to do it? I think its member states are not ready, to be honest. Uh, when you look at the number of displaced people in the world, it has never been so high. When you look at what uh, humanitarian agencies are asking for and what actual money is really pledged, there's a growing gap. So clearly, if we are just in a firefighting mode, so to speak, we're going to fail miserably. Uh, and the only, the only answer is about prevention and looking ahead before those problems get completely out of hand. You, you mentioned uh, Darfur. This was in part a climate-induced uh, crisis because in, in the whole, uh, I mean, for, uh, Simon, Darfur is not in Sahel, but it's a prolongation from, uh, <coughs> from the Horn of Africa to Mauritania. You have a band, uh, a sort of transition between the desert and, and the savanna, and in all that band you have tensions, political tensions, which have existed for centuries, between uh, nomadic uh, people, be, be people who move with their herds of cows or camels, and people who are agriculturists. Now, when there was no uh, climate issue, uh, as they moved in a village, they would find some pasture somewhere uh, to, uh, where, where they could uh, feed their cattle. As those spaces shrink with the climate issue, they don't find it. And if then you had to that a bad political management where the local leaders in villages are, where in the time when they, in the old Sudan they would be just appointed by Khartoum with no knowledge, no local knowledge, that would further inflame things. So it's, it's typical of the crises of today, which are a combination of bad political management, lack of foresight, and then the uh, 
the, the, the scientific fact of uh, uh, drought and, uh, and uh, uh, tensions on, on resources. I mean, you could say that Syria uh, is in sure. part uh, that too. The, the, Syrian, uh, the Syrian crisis, uh, the Syrian tragedy started in southern Syria, uh, which used to be the, 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 the breadbasket of, uh, uh, of, of Syria. And for several years, <laughs> there were bad crops. The uh, farmers were increasingly unhappy. Uh, the support system that had been built by uh, Hafez al-Assad had been dismantled. To be honest, at the instigation of Western countries, which thought this was bad because it was not market economy. So the <laughs> that's the politics of it. Uh, and then when the farmers began demonstrated, uh, they were shot at. And, and the rest is uh, the tragic history we know. Those examples remind us how important it is to uh, increase our support to uh, peacekeeping operations to face uh, upcoming disruptions like those. Um, and we know EU is one of the key contributors to, to such uh, uh, systems at the UN. So that's why I'm turning back to Commissioner Lenarczyk in charge of crisis management at the EU Commission. Uh, because I feel like in the current geopolitics, Global powers like China, the US, look down a bit on the EU. Uh, we've not had any uh, foreign policy as 29, uh, 28 nations for years. Some said there won't be any, any number to call if you wanted to speak to the EU. And now Ursula von der Leyen has, has been willing to put forward a more geopolitical commission. How can we balance the power with our vision of sustainability to make sure that European interests are taken into account in those adaptation strategies um, that our allies facing climate catastrophes will result on us and not on other powers trying to vassalize them? How can we make sure of this? First, let me say that the adaptation is a, is a real challenge those who can afford it, like developed countries, because, you know, they can uh, mobilize uh, themselves the funding necessary to, let's say, introduce uh, more drought-resistant crops, uh, to plant more fire-resistant trees, to uh, <clears throat> to create uh, flood plains so that uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the floods are not as devastating to urban areas, and so on and so on. But the problem is that the, some of those countries that are most exposed to the climate change impact are also the poorest and they need to be helped. Now, on these issues, I can tell you that uh, European Commission and the European Union is already a uh, number one geopolitical player. And I'll give you four, four proofs of that. First, uh, Jean-Marie Guénaud spoke about the humanitarian situations and the climate change impact that increases uh, humanitarian situations in many places, notably uh, in the Sahel. Well, the European Union is number one donor of humanitarian aid together with its member states. Point two, a large uh, segment of adaptation measures is financed by the development assistance. And again, the European Union together with its member states is number one donor of development assistance worldwide. Three, you know that there is a commitment of the developed world that uh, we would uh, provide 100 billion dollars per year in order to help those less uh, uh, able to do so to adapt to the climate uh, change and uh, the challenges associated with that. And we also know that this target has not yet been reached. However, the European Union and its member states have, have contributed their fair share to this $100 billion, it's others, and I will be polite, will not mention who, uh, others who have not yet been able to, to provide their fair share of this sum. And finally, when the, the climate-induced disaster strikes, there is European Union that has a unique mechanism available to any country in the world, and it is called the Union Civil Protection Mechanism. Any country of the world can ask for assistance when it is faced with an overwhelming, overwhelming natural or other disasters. And this is happening all the time. Most recently, it has happened with uh, the earthquake, for instance, in Haiti, or in some other cases with, with droughts and forest fires. And European Union member states 
are able to provide emergency res re assistance immediately. So these are these are the four uh, points that I um, want to present to you that illustrate that European Union is already uh, a geopolitical player when it comes to this particular domain. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. We have uh, still 10 minutes to go to, to, to put an end to that conversation. And I have received one very uh, meaningful question from Marta, which I would like to actually ask to all the panelists of, of this group. It sounds like our conversation is very European itself that the way we envision the solution is European. Like when you ask a French guy to solve a problem, it says create a new institution. That's usual. And the way we address the solution, the, the problem sounds very European, I would say. That's what Marta said. And I, I'm curious to know, because you've been, we, you've been working a lot abroad, Matthias, in many different countries. Stefan, uh, your, your uh, company is working in 35 different countries, including global South. Mr. Gay, I know you, have, you had a universal experience. Um, Denis saying, I'm, I'm asking myself a question. Are we having a very uh, narrow approach to it that is not able to fit with Southern partners? Or are we, is our European approach matchable with our allies and I would say enemies? I'd like first to ask this question to Commissioner Lenarczyk, how you see partnerships possible around those? then to Denis, then to Mathias, then to Stefan, and then to Mr. Gaino. We are dealing uh, here with the global challenges uh, and global phenomena. And I think that the latest uh, uh, report by the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate, uh, on climate Change is, is, is very clear about that. So we need global uh, approach. And I wouldn't say that, that what we try to do is a European approach. I think it's a European contribution to what needs to be a global approach. But we need others to go along. But if, and if you want others to go along, you have to uh, show an example yourself. And I think the European Union has been doing just that and has been doing it better than many others. Turning to you uh, as the second answer, answer for this question, when you look at Chinese approach to uh, climate crisis management, it sounds so easy to have a totalitarian system getting an answer to such a, a complex problem. How do you assess our ability to work with China on those issues? Well, uh, to, to China... Simono, I hope he... Yeah, Denis. So the, the question on China was to me. Yeah, yeah, uh, indeed, yeah. So I'm sorry if I, I was not clear. I'm, I'm not a, I'm not an expert uh, on China, but let me let me uh, just tell you that uh, you know I, I think that uh, as the commissioner said, uh, the fact is that uh, the European Union leader. But uh, you asked me a question on on China. I used to work in a, in a company, in an energy company, uh, NG, previously. And when I visited China with a delegation uh, from the European Union. Uh, led by the European Commission, we had a meeting with the Chinese Minister of uh, Standards and Norms. You know, it, it does exist in China. And so uh, the minister was very keen on saying that you know, the Sanctuary Union, he was uh, in a position to really tackle this issue of climate change because the European Union uh, had developed uh, norms and standards on the, uh, the struggle against uh, climate change. And so I think it was a very uh, nice comment coming from the minister, the minister, because he said that it's really thanks to what you did in uh, the European Union that we have the capacity here in China to deal with this issue as well. And I think that uh, it, uh, it is a good uh, example of the fact that, uh, as the commissioner said, it's a global issue that we have to tackle all together. That's the reason why we need also China to be around the table with us uh, to deal with this issue. And, and Matthias, you've been working in, ex, in a number, in an, an impressive number of geographies with Dana, and so you, you've also that global outlook on the way we can partner with other countries. Do you feel like this approach we've developed all around the, the round table is, is matchable with other agendas? Yeah, I do, I do think so. First, um, 
only f less than 40% of our turnover is uh, European. Uh, we are uh, present in China, we are present in Africa, we are present in many, many countries. Uh, what I wanted to highlight th is the fact that there is a clear interdependencies between Europe and the rest of the world. Uh, some of this connection needs to be uh, promoted, supported. Others, I think, need to be cor corrected. And I just have one example. There is a clear issue about uh, food sovereignty mm -hmm. in Europe. A clear issue. Just one figure. Seven, we depend on other countries for 70% of our protein needs. 70%, which is very high. We need to have some interpretances that we need to promote. There are others that we need to correct. And I just wanted to, uh, to highlight this, uh, this figure. That, that figure is, is indeed key as we've been developing sovereignty um, reflections for the EU in, in the past uh, uh, months along the COVID crisis. This is proteins to feed cattle and not global proteins. Thanks, but this is This is really, uh, I think, a very important figure. It's a, it's a good, uh, good to know uh, that the figures apply to this. Um, Stefan, I'm turning to you because your company is also present in many geographies, but you're also specifically known to work with indigenous people on the ground. And when you get there and work with local communities, um, how do you feel? Is it like you're looked at like it's another European wanted to put us uh, into such a box, or is it another, uh, another look that, put, that is put on you? Our approach is, is very much based on the local community will to act. Because, again, our job is to restore, protect, and create forests. But the first question is, do we have the right to do it? Because we arrive in, in areas where people live. And um, if they don't expect us to act, then it's not relevant for us to act. Who are we to decide what they need? So we always start from what they need. And actually, the, the starting point is them, not us. It's them pro proposing a project to us, and we provide technical and financial support. And we monitor the project over the years after implementing it. So, for instance, if you're in, um, if you're in Senegal, and uh, you, you have your crops, and uh, the production goes down and you cannot live from the, your crops, then you may want to do agroforestry and plant trees within your crops. So you can ask Reforest Action to help with this. So we come and try to answer the social need first. But then we say, okay, we're happy to support if there are KPIs we can track, so we can measure the success, and your project also acts on biodiversity and climate change. But the starting point is a social need coming from the, from the local populations. And if we don't have their support, if, if it doesn't come from them, we simply don't go because we feel we don't have the right to do it. This new kind of humility sounds very different from um, the pushback we received as Europeans from other countries uh, at the UN for many years during the decolonization period. And, and that's what gave us actually to the G20, G77 group that China is leading still. It's an emerging country, it's, a, it's an industrialized country, but it's, it still remains in this uh, marginal group of uh, least developed countries. How do you assess this pushback, uh, Jean-Marie Guénaud, when we can hear that such an approach is so European? Well, I think we have to be honest with ourselves. When you live in a country where a number of children are going to die before the age of five, or don't go to school, or go to very bad school, their priorities are going to be different. Uh, they, when you tell them you have to think of what, what the world will look like in 2050, for a mother whose child will never see 2050, uh, it's not a real issue. And so if we don't understand that kind of perspective, we're not going to go anywhere. Uh, I think it's very important, and in a way that's what Matthias was saying, uh, listening to the social needs. It's very important as we rethink uh, growth uh, to have a growth that is compatible with, uh, with the goals uh, that we have, the broader goals we have relative to, to, to climate. And that is, that is challenging, 
to be honest, because when you look at the, at the per capita GDP of the least developed countries, there is no question that in 20 years from now, even if they have done all the right things, they will produce more carbon <laughs> than they do today. It's ine inevitable. I don't think anybody has found the, the formula to, to, to avoid that. And so it requires uh, a sort of solidarity so that others uh, <laughs> Uh, reduce drastically uh, their, their, can, their carbon uh, footprint. But I, in the message to the poorest countries on earth, uh, if you have a message that growth is not coming, uh, you will not be heard because they are desperately looking for growth and they are right. Thank you so much, Ambassador Gaynor, for, for putting this together. At the end of this panel, I'd like to thank uh, all our panelists. Matthias, thank you so much for bringing Danone's insights into this conversation. Thank you, Stefan, for your um, uh, uh, faith in entrepreneurship's solutions to those global disruptions. And thank you, Reforest Action, for your uh, support uh, in implementing this uh, Rencontre du Développement Durable. We are so grateful that you've been part of this venture. I'd like uh, also to thank Denis Simoneau uh, for both uh, his support as the L'Oréal Vice President for Institutional uh, Relations, but also as the Chairman of our friend, friendly uh, and, 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 and brother think tank, Europa Nova. I'm very proud we could cooperate in that framework too. Uh, I'd like to um, thank Mr. Gaino uh, for having switched a train ticket to be with us uh, today as we move together towards Normandy tonight to keep advocating for peace together. And Mr. Lenarczyk, uh, Commissioner for Crisis Management, thank you again because um, the EU Commission has been very meaning, uh, has brought meaningful support to the organization of the Rencontre du Développement Durable last year, this year, and I'm sure we'll have many opportunities to keep working together. And we look forward to host again your fellow Commissioner uh, Virginie Sinkevicius that will speak, who will speak uh, on the 11th of October at the closing of our day de dedicated to biodiversity and natural resources. I'm now closing up this panel, turning back into French. Merci beaucoup à tous uh, pour cette, uh, ce panel. Vos questions, merci Martha pour cette question. Um, on va terminer ici uh, et je vais uh, sans plus tarder accueillir uh, pour commencer à 18h50 l'ancien commissaire européen uh, Pierre Moscovici, actuellement premier président de la Cour des comptes, puisque le, pro, le plan de relance uh, Next Generation EU dont nous avons parlé au début de cette introduction uh, nous a permis uh, de lever une dette absolument incroyable, 750 milliards d'euros sur les marchés financiers pour pouvoir financer la relance, la première dette commune que les Européens ont mis ensemble. Mais évidemment, ça nous interroge sur uh, la durabilité de, notre, uh, de nos finances publiques. Nous en parlerons uh, à l'européenne avec ce social-démocrate qui a été uh, non seulement ministre de l'économie et des finances, mais également commissaire européen aux affaires économiques. A tout de suite pour la dernière partie de cette journée co-organisée avec l'ENA, le grand entretien avec Pierre Moscovici. Rendez-vous dans 8 minutes.